My man puts out a lot of videos. Woo! Okay. Jordan Peterson pressed on Trump record. Jordan Peterson on trans rights. Elliot Page controversy. Which is better? 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 Probably the trans one, right? He might cry. We have to, we'll open with the trans one. Uh, so I noticed just the other day you were banned from Twitter. Now, you know, I'm somebody, nobody can argue against my lefty credentials. Everybody knows um, I'm a man of the left. Having said that, my, my solution on this issue of social media censorship. Is he okay? I am immediately getting like elderly empathy for Peterson here, you know? Like the, um, yeah, he looks sunburned. Leadership has always been, look, we need to expand First Amendment protections. And the way you do that is to regulate these big he social got hit media by companies a refrigerator like their recently. public utilities. So if you do that, then you, you know, basically you're saying this is the new public square and people can speak their mind here. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, you can't, you know, dox people or do direct threats of violence or anything like anything that's actually illegal will remain illegal. But outside of that, you can't censor people just based on um, political opinion. So, you know, I definitely wouldn't have banned you, suspended you, etc. But I do have a question about that specific tweet that did get you in trouble because, you know, you said something to the effect of, um, well, I don't know if it got me in trouble. You know, I don't think I'm in trouble. Twitter banned me, but I don't consider well, that trouble. That's <laughs> fair enough. Thank you, Jordan Peterson. Semantics. Fair point. Um, but you said something to the effect of, remember when pride was a sin and um, mm -hmm. uh, the criminal physician. And Ellen Page just had her breasts cut off by a criminal physician. A criminal physician, exactly. So my question is, is the physician really criminal? If you agree that adults can decide to transition, then why would the physician be criminal? Don't adults have that right if they want to transition? What? What? Wait! 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 What? Um, is Kyle going to push back on the misgender? Kyle. Kyle isn't like an evangelist for trans right. Like he's trans positive. He's certainly not a transphobe at all. But he's not. He doesn't make his name on being hyper aggressive on those issues. So I think he's going to give a bit more leeway to JP here to give um to to see what he can get out of him. I guess we'll see. JP doesn't really need an excuse to be crazy. So. Not everything legal isn't criminal. Isn't, isn't this guy like an anti-postmodernist? Don't words have meaning to him? If we're, if we're being literal with these definitions here, criminal does in fact mean things that are against the law. If you mean immoral, then just say immoral. And do they have that right? See, I would have left Ellen Page alone if she hadn't been parading her new abs in a fashion magazine. I, I would have left her alone, you see, if it wasn't for the, the glistening abs that he presented to me. I was, I was uh, walking through the grocery store, avoiding the cider cabinet, and I passed by the magazine rack, and those glistening abs invited me with their devilish, uh, 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 chaotic dragon energy. Ugh. How many kids do you think she can convince to convert? A one? Yeah. Thousand? No, not See, I, yeah. No, no, really. I want to. I want one billion children trans. I want to respond to that. Yeah. I think that with the trans community, it's very similar to the gay community, where back when that first became a big issue, people thought, oh, if we talk about it, if it's in magazines or whatever. Also, understand what argument he's actually making here. He's now making the argument that um, it should not be possible for consenting adults to get a procedure or a treatment or to do anything if it could then lead children to doing that thing and they don't want children doing that thing. This is fundamentally an argument against degeneracy in the Nazi sense, uh, an argument uh, against any kind of personal expression that deviates from the moral norm. It does not end with trans people whatever, we're promoting kids to go down that path. But really what happened is people are who they are. And that if they're gay, they just decided to be no. like, yeah, I'm gay. And they were just more open and honest with themselves. So I don't think you're promoting people to do that. No, that's you're just not saying, what happened. If you they are that, it's okay. Wrong. Okay. Well, you're I'm, utterly I'm, I'm, wait, wrong. I'm listening. There's I'm listening. About no, that's right. no, so I no, 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 no. Look, one of no. the reasons that I opposed Bill C-16 in Canada to begin with, this pronoun compelled speech bill, 
Hey, how many people have been arrested on account of misgendering people as account of Bill six, uh, C-16? Does anyone, does anyone have the updated tally on that one? That clip of Jordan Peterson talking about how he would rather be arrested. Hold on. Jordan Peter, I haven't seen that one in ages. Um, man, I don't know if I could find it. He, he's just talking to some reporter, you know? They can drag me away to the, to the, the police if they want was because I knew perfectly well what was going to happen when we introduced confusion about gender identity into the public sphere. Now, the argument was that if we left people with gender dysphoria alone to make their own way and stop torturing them, that we would decrease the mental health load on those individuals. And my analysis as a clinician was that for every one person of that sort that we hypothetically save, we doom a thousand more as a consequence of confusion and then social contagion. I knew the literature on psychogen. I'm sorry, hold on. Would decrease the mental health load on those individuals. And my analysis as a clinician was that for every one person of that sort that we hypothetically save, we doom a thousand more as a consequence of confusion and then social contagion. I knew- So again, this is literally Nazi rhetoric. I, I understand this sounds hyperbolic, but it is that is literally explicitly what it is. He's arguing that social minorities and um, deviant behavior need to be suppressed because all of them represent social contagions that infect people with degeneracy. Um, it is, this is a, 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 an assertion of the fascist body politic in the literal sense. The idea of the nation state as an organ um, where, uh, uh, you know, non-compliant or dissonant uh, uh, elements of that uh, physiology can destroy the whole, you know. It's, it's extremely explicit. There's, it's not even really an analogy. It's just the same rhetoric. Do the literature on psychogenic epidemics. They used to call that mass hysteria. And it's a literature that goes back about 300 years. And whenever you introduce, often when you introduce social confusion, you can produce a psychogenic epidemic, especially among, generally it's adolescent females who are most- So this is complete pseudoscience. Um, this is completely made up. If it, when you heard the term mass hysteria and research goes back 300 years, um, your, your alarm bells should be ringing right there for completely made up. It's, it's essentially just a pseudoscientific justification for a moral panic. Um, anytime something wacky happens, it makes everyone feel wacky, and young women are most susceptible. Um, they said the exact same thing about uh, every modern fashion trend. Uh, you know, um, it's, it, this happens all the time. This rhetoric uh, is employed all the time. Mass hysteria is a thing. Mass hysteria doesn't refer to... Yeah, mass hysteria is used colloquially to describe exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you know, mass hysteria. You know, like in a... Um, like in a... Uh, like an event, you know? Um, and the trauma that can be caused by it. Not people realize trans people exist, therefore everyone gets brain damage. Susceptible to it. So I thought, oh, well, what's going to happen is we'll produce a psychogenic epidemic of gender dysphoria among adolescent females. And that is exactly what's happened. And it isn't the fact that we've freed up people who are, what, in doubt about their identity to be who they are. That may have happened in a tiny minority of cases. It's absolutely and definitely the case that we've doomed thousands of kids to brutal, mutilating surgery and premature sterility and we've done that on the altar of our hypothetical moral virtue and compassion. So if you um, leave aside the, uh, uh, you know, the um, performative antics here, uh, remember that the rate of regret for elective surgeries is generally higher than those surgeries associated with uh, trans people. Uh, the idea that this is leading a majority of people who identify as trans men to regret is um, tragically missing in the literature. You know, it's just so interesting that study after study after study show time and time again that um, 
you know, overwhelmingly people who transition are happy they transitioned. And every time conservatives talk about this, they act as though any second now, at any moment, all these people will wake up and regret what they, um, what they've done. And yet, look, I read a cor corporate analysis of the trans surgery industry last week, growth rate projection for you lefty types and your anti-corporatism, growth rate projection, 15% per year, invest now at $350 million business as of 2022, projected- to Again, $350 million business for a medical institution is really, really small. Um, and the medical industry for hair plugs is 10 billion, which he has had. To expand to 750 million by 2027. No moral hazard there. There's plenty of moral hazard what? there. So that, so this is obviously a ridiculous argument. The idea that an industry is growing means that the, the thing that the industry is trying to do is immoral is completely nonsensical, even from a Marxist perspective. Like, it, it's a completely nonsensical. Um, absolutely no sense whatsoever. What and percentage... that surgery is absolutely brutal. So what percentage of the population do you think, uh, in your conception of how this is unfolding, what percentage of the population do you think is going to end up being trans at the end of this? Do you think, like, oh, one day it's going to be, like, 70% of know, the we know country already, is trans? Well, we know already that about one in five adolescents now identifies, to use that hated word, identifies as part of the hypothetical LGBTQ plus community. Okay. That's, that's not trans though. That's just, what, wait, what does that mean? Hypothetical LGBTQ? The gays, if they existed, what is that? What, what, what who, as opposed to the actual? Um, yeah, a lot of those people are probably just bisexual, which, yeah. So it's one in five. I don't know what the upper limit is. There's wait, one of, wait. See, wait, does he know that LGBT doesn't mean all trans? He doesn't, okay, he doesn't know. It's, yeah. There's a consulting group in the UK now that's claiming there's 150 different genders. There's True. actually, I suppose, 7 billion different genders if you want to get technical about it, True. because everybody's temperament differs. But I don't know what the upper limit is, and I have no idea what the upper Does limit it? is for this surgical intervention. We'll see. Doesn't but that... I don't find it. I, I don't find it the least bit acceptable. And if you think that your compassion is demanding that you extend your uh, pity to the LGBTQ plus community at the cost of sterilizing children, you should think again. You're on the wrong side of this, and not Wait, in a trivial on. way. But the children aren't being sterilized. That's okay. Um. I, you know, one thing that I'm getting from this is that Jordan Peterson is not particularly charismatic and I'd have really fucking want to debate him. Oh my god, I want to debate him. He's talking about bottom surgery? Yeah, 15-year-olds ain't getting bottom surgery here in the States. You know, maybe there are some... Yeah, maybe if you can... If you want to, you know, pull out the divining rod, point it to maybe some one case or something. HRT has a chance of permanent sterilization as well. Um to the level that it would permanently um, sterilize somebody who's still a teenager, oftentimes uh, puberty blockers are employed until a point where HRT can be employed, like later. Usually, yeah, the kids don't go directly on HRT. Don't, I, I, I would appreciate if you don't ascribe beliefs to me that I don't have. Remember, my original question was well, about, you said earlier in well, this I said, question that, I said that you Elliot were, Page is an adult, and so do you think that he has the right to yeah, transition? But the, that was the original question. You made question. some comments after that. Yeah, but as a star mm -hmm. and a public figure and a model for emulation, mm -hmm. she also has the responsibility not to entice confused adolescents into a catastrophic decision before they have the maturity. That language right there, entice. Keep in mind, Elliot Page hasn't done anything here. This is an argument against his existence. This is a this is literally just an existential argument. It's not even uh, you can't say or believe this. It's that El like the the only logical follow through from his prescription is that Elliot Page should be dead. 
That's that's the only thing you can really do. If you want, you can. Oh yeah, they just want no one to be trans. But yeah, that that's totally what happens when the far right takes control. They're just like, oh no, we won't kill all of the people we've been saying are degenerate groomers who are destroying society. Um, we'll just let all of you detransition. Like no, he doesn't want trans people to exist. If you ask most um, white nationalists, by the way, they're actually very. Um, they tend to be pretty quiet about what, how exactly they want to achieve their ethnostate. They'll usually talk about the fact that they want their ethnostate, right? The ethnostate arguments aren't as common these days as they were a couple years ago, but you guys remember, don't you? White ethnostaters will talk about how important it is that we have a white ethnostate, how we need to have a white ethnostate, and when you ask them, well, how will you achieve it? All of a sudden, they get, you know, kind of tetchy. Oh, you know, like maybe people will choose. Now, think throughout history. When white ethnostaters gain political power, what choice do they make? They're all, they're all very touch and go up until they have power. You know, ah, you know, whatever, people will choose to leave, you know. And then when they, choose, when they chain power, you know, we know what choice they make. We know. ...to make that decision. I just have to say, Jordan, I think it's a little bit of a moral panic. I just don't see some sort of, you know... Frenzy of okay, what would you consider become trans? What first of all, that's a hell of a way to put it. What? Is, Why don't you that... take a look at the increase in, in surgical interventions and see what you think? I mean, how many do you think well, is too many? How again, many needs, wait, look, the, if we're talking about uh, none, it, it, there's no number that's too many. The only number that would be too many is more than the amount people want. It's an elective surgery. How many, how many, how many double mastectomies are done in the United States every year? Um, double mastectomies, U.S. yearly. I mean, how, how many? Top surgeries, U.S. yearly? Um, I'm not, I'm not getting much useful information here. I don't, I don't know. I'll Suffering. answer your question. I'll answer your question. The argument is it, it used to be very repressed because that's very outside of the tradition and the norm and the standard. And that now what when you sort of let the be, boot off the neck a little bit. Suppressed? What used to be suppressed? All the, exactly. the entire LGBTQ community. I mean, it was very recently we okay, even got gay all, marriage in the a, United States. First of all, they're not a community. For a person who claims to hate word games, he sure does love his semantics. When you say community, it means you're referring to a broad group of people. It doesn't literally mean they're all part of the same Sunday club. Well, you understand what the is point this I'm community? making. We'll see, like, no, he's, I'm, he's no, filibustering. Actually, neither I understand it nor you, and that's why we're delving into it. <laughs> First of all, they're not a community. That's just a catchphrase. It's a, it's, yeah, it's, yes, it's a term that just refers to the group. It's like saying the Christian community when there are like five trillion subdivisions of Christianity. Like, we know. Yep. And I'll tell you something else, that almost all the kids who are undergoing surgical intervention the clinical literature is absolutely clear on this. 80% uh -huh. of kids with gender dysphoria identify as homosexual when they mature. 80%. Wait, what do they mean when they, when they mature? I, I need to see that source. Can I get a source on that? Can anyone? Hold on. Study gender dysphoria homosexuality. Is this the Blanchard study from 1987? Yep, it is. A Blanchard study from 1987 with a sample size of about 200 people. The, the study uses the term cross-dressing. The study of 87 getting brain damage. Blast from the past. All right, well, thank you, Jordan Peterson. I'm glad I Googled this. Only in my wildest dreams could I have assumed. Listen to this. Some history of fetishistic arousal? This is, this is, this is being written back during the fucking burning of, 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 of Paris. This is, this, is, this is being written back when... Um, this is being written back when the trans community was like five black women in the Bronx with wigs who all called each other hermaphrodites. Like, this is... <laughs> this didn't exist back then. Everything has changed. This would, be, this would be a very easy study to replicate these days, too. The literature is crystal clear. 
according to this one tablet of stone unearthed from the Mesopotamian ruins. And that means the vast majority of people who are being converted surgically are gay. I could have told you that. Now, how is that an advantage to the gay community precisely? What? 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 Wait, why did he just say gay community? I thought the community was... Wait, what? It doesn't have to be an advantage to the gay community. It has to be out of the individual interest of the person doing it. They're not, they're not slaves to the will of their community. If they want to transition, they can transition. So? No. See, I'm not, I'm not taking a position in any way. Shape. He means they're cis gay and they become straight? Well, if you're a gay man and then you transition to a woman, but you still like men, then you would then be a straight woman, yeah. So, if a person wants to live that life, then go for it. Shape or form on the kids, because I don't know the well, first thing about this to comment on the kids. Well, but see, that's why we're having this conversation, though, is because my original question was about kids. the adults and what your take is on the adults. Hmm. And it sounds to me like, let me ask you guys, would you ban transition surgery for adults he totally would he's thinking of how to phrase it but he would i don't know yeah he really would. yeah 100%. really we're paying a big price for it and i think well, that i think that it was um it was a, an act of stunning hubris to conduct the first trans surgery procedure but and it's not obvious to me hubris this is a moralistic argument and a religious one as well the idea that the human body is sacred and transitioning uh, is a is a a, a, a a alteration of its form that has defied God's order. Yeah, this is also a pretty common fascist talking point. Even secular fascists tend to refer to the apex of physical um, of of physical appearance and uh, performance. Uh, of it being a kind of um, sacred element of humanity. You see this often in fascist media, don't you? The idea of the Ubermensch. I mean, not the Ubermensch in the traditional, um, you know, Nietzschean sense, which is interesting and worth reading about, but the Ubermensch in the fascist sense, which is just like a muscular blonde guy, basically. Uh, they're obsessed with muscular, hairless, blonde men, aren't they? Very faggy. Uh, but the obsession has to do with the idea of a kind of apex, like a, a pinnacle existence that they refer to. At all, that it's been a net social good. And but so, aren't there some people that are obviously trans who were born in one body, they feel like they're in the other body, and when they're an adult, they can make the decision. And then even from just a freedom and right. liberty... I'm going to settle this right now. Sorry. I was uh, I, I, I switched over to my main camera because I was opening Clip Studio Paint, and I forgot that this was the thing that I already had loaded. So, what is this? Don't worry about it, okay? Okay. Oh, wait, this is super small. All right, listen, okay? You guys need to understand. This is how science works, okay? Here is a person. All right? It's a guy. His main interest is fantasy football. Okay? But oh no. What's that in there? What's that? What's that? That's right. It's the gay tumor. Shaped like dick and balls. This tumor exists in the minds of every gay. It is the single unifying cause of homosexuality, transgenderism, and autism. Usually all three. It's that simple, okay? Just right up in here. Big, it's like, honestly, half the brain size. That explains the voices. It explains the gay lisp. It explains the clothing. It explains everything, okay? This is why if any of you have gay submissive friends, you can slap them on the back of the head and they moan a bit. It's because of the big throbbing tumor that has replaced about a, a half of their brain space. It's that simple, okay?
People like Jordan Peterson, they make it all complicated. Liberty perspective, shouldn't they have that right? Even if they do it and then they regret it, shouldn't they have the right to try it? It's a good question. I mean, it's a tricky one, right? Because there's all- No, it's actually not. If you believe in living in a free society, the question, should we allow people to do things willfully with full consent and knowledge, even if they might later regret it? It's usually a pretty easy one to answer. All sorts of surgical enhancement procedures that are obviously, it's not obviously appropriate to make them illegal. And I don't know exactly where the cutoff line is, so to speak, and that's partly why we're having a public discussion about it. But uh, this, this, this entire argument, in many ways, is stated so idiotically that it almost defies description. Oh, I should qualify because I know people are going to be um, pedantic about that. The only times, generally speaking, we're not consistent about this, but for the most part, the times that we deny people the ability to do something that they can otherwise fully consent to is if it's damaging to the public trust, if it would be harmful to society broadly. Um, so a common example here, the most evident counterexample would be seat belts, airbags, and bicycle helmets. Um, three things that technically potentially only affect you in terms of your health if you choose not to do it we're a little bit ambivalent on stuff like that there are other things though where like for the most part like you can't knock down an interior wall sometimes within a building um because it could lead to like structural collapse there are fire regulations and codes stuff like that usually like usually when we say you can't do a thing even with full knowledge and consent it's because somehow doing that thing would fuck over other people we're not always consistent about that but for the most part we are you know seatbelts absolutely endanger others your body becomes a projectile i guess that's true i mean what do you mean feel like you're in the wrong body what well, kind of measurement is that? Now, hang on a sec. I was gonna there are you. rules <laughs> for these sorts of diagnostic decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. The rule is that you have to make a valid and reliable diagnosis. That's if you're diagnosing depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or cancer or anything like that. There are standards that you have to abide by mm. in order to make a diagnosis, in order to fulfill the obligations of your professional college. Okay. If someone comes to you and says, I feel like I have lung cancer. That is not sufficient grounds upon which to formulate a diagnosis, much less proceed to surgery. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what? what do you mean by feel? What is that? Is that? Wait, I, I'm going to get brain damage here. Wait, he was almost on the right track. Lung cancer manifests physically. Gender dysphoria doesn't. Like depression, you would have to say, I feel like if they have depression, like the example you were just using, Jordan Peterson, we're talking about psychiatric behavior for which how you feel is the only thing <laughs> that psychiatrists can go off of. You Like th that's it. And by the way, the medications that you can get for stuff that's based off nothing but what you feel can be pretty serious. You can feel your way into anti, um, uh, um, anti-psychiatric, what's that, um, anti-psychotics? That's the term, right? Anti-psychotic medication? That can, like, fuck your brain. Um, there are plenty of medications that you can get from a psychologist based only off of, um, uh, testimony, essentially, that you've provided. Uh, 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 that can really fuck you over the, with the antipsychotics and stuff like that. Now, mind you, okay, the difference here is that, as I understand it, getting all the medical shit in order for transitioning requires way the fuck more psychiatric intervention than almost any other kind of medication that you could want. If you want Adderall, if you want SSRIs, if you want anti-anxiety meds or anti-psychotics, if you want Xanax, if you want any of these medications, fuck, if you want opium, an opioid, go to a doctor, tell them you have pain, go to a psychiatrist, tell them you feel X, Y, or Z, okay? You'll get medication. You can get it. It's not that hard. Um... It's more difficult for trans people than it is for all this crap, you know? Like, he was on the right track there, but then he just, like, randomly swapped over into something that has an empirical basis for diagnosis. Okay. Sure.
Doesn't the process for trans folks often take years? Yeah, I don't like to comment exactly on how long it takes because it really depends on a ton of factors. Local law, country that you're in, state, city, doctor availability, the tendencies of those doctors, you know, it can be a while. I've known people who have been able to get HRT as adults relatively quickly, and I know people who have been waiting for years as adults. There's um, a lot. And then surgery is its whole own thing. Not to mention the uh, financial barriers. Getting top surgery or getting like facial recon, uh, not facial reconstruction, Jesus, facial um, feminization surgery or whatever, stuff like that. That shit could be expensive, um, which, is, which is its own kind of gatekeep. Whereas with, um, whereas with a lot of psychiatric medication that you can take, that shit can be pretty cheap. Aren't anti, like you can get antipsychotics, powerful stuff, pretty cheap, can't you? Like the strength of a medication isn't proportional to its cost. Not at all. There are medications that are incredibly cheap, um, that are, um, th that are incredibly, like, powerful. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Is that an emotion? Is it a motivation? Well, is it a philosophical so, conclusion? What is so it? Let, let, me explain, let me explain to you what I mean. Let me explain to you what I mean. So I've been doing my show for about a decade. And about mm -hmm. two or three years into doing my show, there were, you know, some stories here and there that I covered about the trans issue. Somebody who is trans reached out to me and explained to me in a very straightforward way. Yeah, look, I was born biologically female. I feel like I'm biologically male. My reality what does never that mean? lined up. Well, me, I'm just explaining what they said, and then you can respond. Remember that Jordan Peterson was a psychiatrist. Wait, was psychologist or psychiatrist? I forget which one he was. He was a brain doctor. Um, what does that mean, feel? Psychologist, yeah. What does that mean, feel? Like, that's his job to know that. He should be offering insight into this conversation, not, like, detracting from it. Whoever you'd like to respond. And they told me, as soon as I got the surgery, changed the way I dressed, changed the way I appeared, I felt phenomenally better. And so that's why, at least for me, this was the answer. Now, I think it would be incredibly... Also, if, I'm so sorry for pausing a lot, but I want to add to this. If you ever want to explain this shit, okay? All you have to do is imagine a cis, like, guy, like Jordan Peterson, and be like, okay, what if we just made you wear a dress and everyone treated you like a woman for the rest of your life? How would that make you feel? I, like, gender dysphoria is kind of an abstract thing, but, he, like, guys, leave the horny posting aside for a second and really think about it, okay? I don't have any, like, innate biological aversion to any women's clothing, right? Like, I'm, I'm a guy, and I'm happy being a guy. I don't really care, like, that much about it, I guess, but... I would be pretty miffed having to run around wearing a dress. I just wouldn't feel, uh, I don't know, wouldn't feel like a, a phenomenally authentic presentation uh, of myself. And um, being treated like a woman, you know, this is something like, do it for a day, okay. If I had to do that shit for my life, I would be, pr I, that would be like actually very upsetting. In fact, we know this is the case because um, dressing uh, male prisoners of war as women and treating them as women has been a component of psychological torture used against them for a pretty long time, like certainly longer than a century, you know. People don't like being treated like the gender that they're not. Um, hey, Shu. Uh, um, they just don't. You know, people, I feel like people try to make gender dysphoria out to be this really unique thing. And don't get me wrong, it is to an extent, but there are so many relatable elements to it. And I feel like it, it makes so much sense if you just think about it for a second, you know? Like, hey, so here are some things we know for a fact, okay? Um, dressing male prisoners of war up as women and treating them as women has been a component of torture and humiliation against them for a long time. We know that. We also know that most of the cis guys participating in this conversation, if they were forced to wear women's clothing and be treated as a woman for the rest of their life, they would really fucking hate that because it wouldn't feel like themselves. So if you acknowledge that, like, can you understand then how people can have really strong feelings attached to their internal and external perception of their gender and identity? It's pretty simple stuff, you know? There are versions of this stuff that are present everywhere. Bodybuilders, male bodybuilders, have massive, like, rates of body dysphoria. Like, these are the most ripped dudes in the world, and they're, like, in front of the mirror pinching their, like, the the tiny, like, bit of fat around their 19-inch biceps going, like, eesh, you know? Um, the, the idea of, like, an irrational dissatisfaction with your body is a basically ubiquitous human experience. And I say irrational because if we were all perfectly rational, we wouldn't really be capable of being made to feel negatively about our own bodies, right? It would just be a fact of the world. We would never, like, look at our body and think negatively about it. 
only a desire to change it if it would be like more healthy or whatever. But of course, we are irrational. We have identities, we have personas, and we have strong opinions about what we should be, what we like would be better as, what we want ourselves to be. And we feel bad if we don't have those things, uh, if we can't uh, achieve those things. So I don't think that means that that's dysmorphia, not dysphoria. No, no, no. Listen to what I'm saying. They're relatable concepts. Yeah, the words are different, but we're referring fundamentally to a human trend, a, 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 a human, a physiological tendency, which is a, a strong sense of attachment to a, 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 a given physical state, a physiological and social representation internally and externally. This may manifest in different ways, and certainly it does with trans people, but this is a ubiquitous experience, is it not? Have we not all felt some version of this? Have, tell me, is there a single person in chat, trans or cis, who has not at some point in their life thought, hmm, this isn't slash shouldn't be me, when thinking about some element of their body or face or whatever that they don't like? Maybe not all of you, but that's pretty common. That's pretty common. I don't even think it's necessarily unhealthy to feel that way. It just seems like an externalized, prescriptive version of a desire for self-improvement in many cases. But here's the thing. A lot of the ways in which I can self-improve to change the way my body looks, trans people can't without medical intervention. If I want to lose weight, I can do that. If I want to be stronger, I can do that. If a trans person wants to grow breasts or lose theirs, they might need some help. Uh, it's not something they can just do at the gym. But I don't think there's that much of a difference on a fundamental level, on a, on, a, on a philosophical level, between a guy who is unhappy with his flabby body going to the gym to work out, and a trans person who is unhappy with her flat chest getting some HRT to make the titties go booby. On a fundamental level, I think there's something relatable there, a commonality. Not identical in experience, but you know, um, you understand what I'm saying, I hope. Yes, the, the breasts boob boobily and so on. Um, and it also, um, it also changes a lot, like depending on um, like the trans person. Do you support universal breast gym for all? Of course I do. Another really good example of this, by the way, would be um, uh, uh, dudes with small dicks who are unhappy about it. Um, thanks to the predominance of porn, a lot of guys have really weird ideas about what like a regular dick size is. So they're out there on Pornhub watching Danny D like rearrange the guts of some chick while two inches of his dick is still outside of her. And they're like, man, my dick's only like five and a half inches or whatever, which I think is like average, basically. Um, but they feel really bad about that. And because there's such a heavy association between it being a man and having a big dick, that's a very strong cultural association right there. Um, not, by the way, an inherent one, because remember, the Greeks thought that large penises were barbaric and that small penises were dignified, refined, uh, and big brain. Uh, so not an inherent thing, but, you know, we have a cultural association between these variables. And, um, you know, as a product of that, oftentimes when you look at, like, forums for incels or whatever, the way they talk about their small dicks, or their allegedly small dicks, you know, um, it's often really similar to the way trans people pre-transition talk about their own bodies. In fact, the language is almost identical. Seriously, you can look through it. Um, the, um, the, the, the relationship is like, it's basically like one-to-one -one with like TTCT, like trans people, seething and coping or whatever. And then like the incel forums and TTTT is just an incel forum for trans people, by the way. And then the cis incel forums, I should say, and they're coping about that. But like the language used is really similar. It's this discomfort and dissatisfaction physically with their body that is being analogized into a dissatisfaction with their identity and their self and external perception. Does that make sense? The only thing I'm trying to get at here is that this is like a really common thing. And I feel like as a psychologist, uh, Jordan Peterson should be able to understand this a little bit better. But of course he's an idiot and he also doesn't really practice his field. So, you know, yeah, so it's not, yeah, whatever. But I just want the people in my audience who are cis to get it. You know, I'm cis, so I'm kind of like, peering in through the outside here, you know, I don't have a, a an innate understanding, but I, I just, I have, I, when it comes to basically all issues, all issues, I have always held the belief that all people are basically the same, no matter how rich or poor, good or bad, 
black or white, man or woman, all people are basically about the same in very fundamental ways. And most of the things that make us different are just different takes, different spins on fundamental, intrinsic characteristics of humans. Um, that everything that can be bad in one person can be good in another. Every experience that is unique to a person of a given group can be um, can actually just be a different type of a common experience to everyone else. Uh, you know, there are coping mechanisms for wealth that ultra wealthy people use to manage their exorbitant expenses that are not at all dissimilar from the coping mechanisms that ultra poor people use to manage other elements of their life. It's just different systems being used in different ways for um, different purposes. Sorry, Ravelli, but yeah. Arrogant for me to say back to that person, no, you shouldn't do that, or I know better than you do for yourself. Now, that's not to say that every time somebody does this, it works out well, of course, because everybody's an individual. But in some instances, that's the answer. So, you know, me as a simple outsider, I just look at it and say, hey, whatever floats your boat, and if it works, it works. Look, most of the time, my attitude is you can go to hell in handbasket any way you choose if you're an adult. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, this problem is complicated and compounded by the fact of the necessity of medical involvement and the ethics on the medical front. So when you asked me about how that should be regulated, my answer was I'm not exactly sure about that. Yeah, Although it isn't obvious to me that the... that. It's obvious to me that the trans surgery enterprise has gone way too far, way too far. Thousands of people too far. Based on what? What thousands of people in a country of hundreds of millions? How? What? How? Where? By what metric? How? How do you determine that? How can you say this? And I'm certain that it's harmed exponentially more people than it's helped. By what me then why does all the data that we have on trans surgery suggest that the rate of regret is so low? Oh, I think all that's right, guys, what you just saw was a teaser clip from my podcast with Dr. Jordan Peterson. So you have to see the whole thing. I don't want anybody to think, oh my God, this is out of context or that's out of context. No, the full thing is available to watch, totally unedited. You have to check. That was a teaser. That was a pretty big teaser. Joe Rogan does the same thing, doesn't he? Um, see, no, I, I like Kyle. I have, I have always liked Kyle. Listen, Kyle Kalinske and I have obviously had some pretty serious political disagreements, a la Bernie or Buss and plenty of other things, but Kyle, listen, okay, Kyle is one of the very few people, every single time I've talked with him in DMs or whatever, he's been super honest and upfront and straightforward, like an actual guy. That's Kyle's thing, okay? He's an actual guy. And as many disagreements as I might have with him, God knows, you know, fucking Ukraine or Bernie or Bust or the shit with Jimmy Dore and like the Kasparian, all that, you know. And I hold those disagreements. I believe them, you know, I don't forget them. However, he is an actual guy. He's a human being, which elevates him miles above so many people on this platform. Um, a hungry guy, yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of want to watch, I kind of want to watch the other one too. Jordan Peterson pressed on Trump record. Then maybe tomorrow we can watch the video where Jordan Peterson basically says that Russia was justified in invading Ukraine. If you were we have to space out our Jordan Peterson content. This is the other teaser. Uh, Jordan Peterson pressed on Trump record. If you were an American citizen, you were here in the 2020 election, would you have voted for Trump, Biden, nobody, or a third party candidate? I don't know. You know, you do, it's very hard to answer those questions until you're actually in the situation. When Clinton was facing off against Trump, for a very long time, I felt that I would have voted for Clinton. I felt that she had the, at least the administrative background and the governmental experience to know what the job was and to handle it. So this, this is obviously ridiculous. I don't know how much of this is dishonesty and how much of this is brain rot, but um, Jordan Peterson is obviously more ideologically aligned with Trump than he is, um, th than he is anyone else. The, um, the reason he's doing this, I suspect, is because it's more effective for his brand as, a, as, like a, as like who he is for him to come across as like an angry, disaffected intellectual who's sick of the establishment rather than a political operative. Of course, he works for the Daily Wire now, so, um, it, you know, the, it's a pretty thin veneer of plausible deniability, but I, I suspect that's the reason uh, for this. I felt that Trump was 
a wild card, which he most definitely was. Then I went to this, uh, the night of the election, I went to this Republican gala in Canada at a private club uh, watching the election, and they did a straw vote there. And in the straw vote, I cast my vote for Trump. And that surprised me. And it was something I sort of switched on last minute. And the reason I switched, I would say, is because I thought Clinton betrayed the working class. <laughs> In fact, that's why she lost the election. It isn't something I just felt. That's definitely what happened. And so I thought, to hell with you. You know, I'd rather have this wild card in here with his spontaneous lies than have you in here with your programmatic, powered, mad, driven, uh, pre-authorized lies. Proletarian Peterson. Dude, if only Peterson was a leftist, we could have had modern um, Lysenkoism, couldn't we? He could have, dude, he would have been amazing. Holy shit. He could have been like a, a huge public figure and every once in a while, every once in a while, he, he would announce that like the, you know, the, the, the future for workers' rights is the construction of a great land bridge between, um, between Venezuela and like um, the Cape of Africa. And it would be suspended entirely by like the proletarian will. You know, it's like we we just we just need a hundred and fifty million blue collar workers on either end, like levitating bricks. He'd still be dishonest, though. Probably, yeah. Modern Lysenkoism, yeah. For any of you guys, yeah. For any of you guys who don't know, Lysenko was first of all a giga chad. Look at his face. Oh my god. He looks like he should have been a Nazi, but no, uh, Soviet. Big difference, I know, right? Um, but anyway, he um, <laughs> rejected Mendelian genetics in favor of his own idiosyncratic pseudoscientific ideas, later termed Lysenkoism. What crazy shit was this about? Uh, I, I still don't... Lamarckism, let me see. More than 3,000 mainstream biologists were dismissed or imprisoned. They literally, like, did a mass arrest of scientists because he had a fake science to push. Numerous scientists were executed in the Soviet campaign to suppress scientific opponents. The president of the Soviet Agriculture Academy, Nikolai Ve Vevilov, who had been Lysenko's mentor but later denounced, was sent to prison and died there while Soviet genetic research was effectively destroyed. This was, um, this was effectively the equivalent of the Nazis, like, throwing Einstein out, you know? When they thought that, a, like, um, rel uh, general relativity was, like, Jewish science or whatever. Um... Yeah, this was this was their version of that. Was didn't they didn't they literally think that like communist plants would grow better next to each other or some shit like that? Basically, yeah, lol. God, that's based. Really? Yeah, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. 1928 rejected actually that Tofim Lysenko claimed to have developed agriculture which could radically increase crop yields. These included vernalization, species transformation, inheritance of acquired characteristics. That's, uh, that would be like, um, a, that, that, that would be like, a, like a, a dad loses their arm and then has a kid and the kid is born without an arm because the dad didn't have one, even though it's not written into the DNA of the spermatozoa. Yeah, Lamarckism. And vegetative hybridization. He claimed in particular that vernalization, exposing wheat seeds to humidity and low temp could greatly increase crop yield. He claimed further he could transform one species pasta wheat into another, bread wheat, by two to four years of autumn planting. Since T. durum is a tetraploid with 28 chromosomes and T. vulgare is a hexaploid with 42, Western geneticists at the time already knew this was impossible. Literally, like, transform one plant into another. It's the inframaterialist from Disco Elysium. No, this, that's what they were based on, yeah. Um, Lysenko further claimed that the Lamarckian inheritance of acquired characteristics occurred in plants the eyes of potato tubers. He claimed that when a tree is grafted, the sand permanently changed the heritable characteristics of the stock. This would constitute vegetative hybridization. This is just modern day alchemy. No, dude, alchemy, alchemy made more sense than this, okay? He used his position to denounce biologists as fly lovers and people haters, and to decry the wreckers in biology who he claimed were trying to disable the Soviet economy and cause it to fail. He was responsible for millions of deaths. Oh yeah, he caused famines. 
Lysenko forced farmers to plant seeds very close together, uh, since according to his Law of the Life of Species, plants from the same class never compete with one another. <laughs> Lysenko played an active role in the famines that killed millions of Soviet people. This is, we live in a joke world, dude. This is a joke planet, okay? I know, like, everyone jokes that Stalin was flippant with the lives of the people in the Soviet Union, but the idea of, like, pl plant wheat seeds close together. They are of same class. They, are, they, they collaborate. Class uh, collaboration. They, together they strong and then millions die of starvation like that's just too good it's too pre it's too, imagine imagine being like a commune worker or like or one of those gigantic um you know like uh like like soviet housing blocks or whatever and you're slowly starving to death while staring at a propaganda mural painted on the side of your building um talking about like lysenko's new strategy which is to just gather all the seeds together in a big ball and like punch it into the ground and that like together they would rise stronger than before or whatever. Oh my god. Criticism from foreigners did not sit well with Lysenko who loathed western bourgeois scientists and denounced them as tools of imperialist oppressors. He especially detested the American-born practice of studying fruit flies, the workhorse of modern genetics. Dude, we, okay, we deserve to win the war, all right? America had the Manhattan Project. We were learning shit. Meanwhile, the Soviets, uh, the Soviets are out here trying to, like, uh, you know, plants of the same class will not compete for resources because they're, the, the class consciousness. And the, the, the Nazis are talking about how atomics, like, atomic science is Jewish or whatever. Like, we deserve to win, okay? God damn it. <laughs> These jokers. China adopted his methods. Um, does it say that here? Yep. Thanks, Mao. Mao Zedong adopted his methods starting in 1958 with calamitous results, resulting in the Great Chinese Famine, where some 15 to 55 million people died. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. That's a Mao moment right there, dude. That's that's a Mao moment. Ooh. God damn, dude. Literally fucking three to eight holocausts. <laughs> dude, holy... Do you guys think that Lysenko was on the State Department payroll? That guy killed more commies than literally any human alive. Lys like, Lys Lysenko was responsible for more internal catastrophe and fucking genocide in the... <laughs> oh my god. Ugh. <sighs> well. You're an idiot, Vosh. You can't compare the intentional murder of Jews, the Soviet ineptitude and starvation in China that wasn't intentional. Uh, I was just comparing death counts. Um, in terms of, like, malice or whatever, yeah, the Holocaust is worse because the deliberate killing of ethnic uh, groups is worse than, like, incidental death. That's why I'm laughing at this, you know? You can't really laugh at the Holocaust. There's just not that much funny there unless you're watching, like, uh, Mel Brooks. No, wait. Is Mel... Wait. Who made Blazing Saddles? Was that Mel Brooks? Is that someone else? Yeah, Mel Brooks. Yeah, if it's a Mel Brooks bit, you can laugh at whatever. You know, he's Jewish. He's funny. It's good. Um, however, it, you are legally obligated to laugh at these famines. What else can you do? Like, see, like what else can you do when looking at this? What, like, what other reaction is possible? God. Be sad at human stupidity. Yeah. Oh yeah, Jordan Peterson. Now this regime made propaganda claim the whistle. Wait, what? Mao's regime made propaganda claiming they planted wheat so close together it was so strong you could stand at it. Oh no! Oh god! Dude, imagine being a scientifically illiterate Chinese peasant or whatever, and you're you're like, okay, 
I hope the famines stop. I really, really, really hope they abandon this process and just let us plant these wheat seeds far enough apart for them to not steal nutrients from each other. Meanwhile, at, at, at fucking Mao's harem palace, full of 14-year-olds, apparently. Yeah, we... No, no, no more dirt, comrades. We will walk on the seeds. Ah. <sighs> Fuck, that's funny. Well, Stalin was the head murderer of communists anyway, you're just going very close to equating the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, which is a fascist tactic to try to rehabilitate Nazis and fascists. No, no, no. I equate... No, wait. I'm not getting close to equivocating the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. I am equivocating them. They were ideologically incredibly similar. Yeah, there were massive similarities on almost every level politically between them. I'm not trying anything. And I'm not doing to rehabilitate Nazis and fascists. I'm doing it to condemn the Nazis and fascists in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. There is no reason any modern leftist should be wasting breath defending the Soviet Union. I'm anti-fascist. All fascists. The Soviet fascists. The Nazi fascists. All fascists. And so I don't know. It's hard to tell what you'll do in a situation until you're actually in it. Do you think Trump as president in his four years also betrayed the working class? Um, not in the same manner, no. Really? And I think Trump did some things that were really quite spectacular. Uh, like one what? of them. Like what? Well, how about no war? Well, he did assassinate a top Iranian commander. No, 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 no. Was fighting. Think... What, is, what, what do you mean no war? He was in the same number of wars as Obama, and he continued the drone strike program, escalating significantly. He escalated the drone strike program, and he continued the wars. It was Biden who dropped the drone strikes, and Biden who left Afghanistan. Based-ass Biden. I didn't say, say that. About, I didn't say anything about assassination. I said something very specific. Yeah. You, I would say Trump that's an act of not, war. No, it's not an act of war. It's an assassination. An act of war. An Wait, missile? Wait. Missile striking a foreign general in, a, in an airport isn't an act of war? Yeah, it is. The only reason it didn't lead to all-out warfare is because we're a nuclear country and they're not. That's absolutely 100% an act of war. Assassination is an act of war. Like, yeah? It, like, this wasn't some covert fucking 007 shit. We missile striked an airport. An Iranian commander? I don't understand the point you're making. Well, I'm trying what? to say if in Iran, if the Iranians killed one of our generals, we would call that an act of war. We do it to them and it's not an act of war. All right, then I guess we have to differentiate between an act of war and a war. What you have right now with Russia, that's a war. And yeah, Trump did not. Yeah, with, with, with Ukraine. We're not at war with Russia. Thankfully. Okay. Not in engage the U.S. in a war of that sort. And so that was a signal contribution. He also established the Abrahamic Accords, which have got nowhere near enough attention, not near the attention they deserve. And, and the people who negotiated that should have won a Nobel Peace Prize, because that brings the possibility of peace to the Middle East. And that consider, was a big. That was a big accomplishment. Both of those things. Do you consider the didn't didn't the Abrahamic Accords not like do shit? I know it was a big PR piece for like um for like Zionists or whatever. I I don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't I don't think it. I don't think it changed much. I didn't read that much into it. They were just massive giveaways to Israel. Wait, was this when they moved the capital? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The U.S. Uh, the U. Not the not the capital. The U.S. Embassy. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The, the giant increase in drone strikes under Trump, problematic. What do you mean problematic? You mean desirable? Do do you because you said oh he didn't get us in a new war but I would consider all those bombings which are illegal by the way an act of war. Do you think I didn't that those say are... that Trump? I didn't say that Trump's record was unblemished mm. or that there weren't skirmishes of various sorts. I'm not trying to paint him. Uh, I'm not trying to paint him beige, and or I'm not trying to whitewash him. I'm perfectly aware of Trump's flaws and his advantages. But 
he didn't embroil the U.S. in a war. And you guys have been embroiled in a pointless war for for what? How long now? Since the night which, which by Bi which Biden ended and Biden ended the war. 1960s, one after uh, another. And then the yeah. Abraham Accords are a big deal. And, and so, and did he betray the working class? Well, I think that's in some sense a vague, it's a vague question. Well, Trump didn't betray the working class because he was never on the side of the working class. That's like, that's like saying that the, the hens have been betrayed by the wolf. He was a, a, a socialite real estate billionaire who entered off of very vague worker populist prescriptions alongside a bunch of much more explicit advocacies for deregulation and privatization, which he then followed through on. And he lowered taxes for the rich permanently, lowered them for the not rich only temporarily, um, and generally legislated in a deregulative manner that benefited the ultra wealthy. It's not, it's not a betrayal, it's just what he does. Hillary definitely betrayed the working class because she decided to go with the woke mob instead of her typical, in typic, in, instead of the typical base of power wow. that the Democrats had always relied on. So, what? What does that? This doesn't mean anything. What? What the fuck does that have to do with the working class? What does that mean? What economically progressive policies did she back off of because she was trying to appeal to social progressives? What, that doesn't mean any. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Can I give that you was an a example? Decision. Can I give sure. you an example on Trump betraying the working class? Because there's a few things you could point to. First of all, there was uh, net outsourcing of jobs under his administration when he campaigned as the opposite. The second thing is his number one legislative accomplishment was a 2017 tax cut where 83% of the benefits went to the top 1%. So those are two examples of, you know, he campaigned as the anti-outsourcing guy, then there was net outsourcing under his administration. And in fact, that same tax bill incentivized outsourcing. And then again, that tax bill mostly benefited the wealthy, and it didn't help the working class. So that's what I mean by betraying the working class. I think he campaigned in a very populist way, but in terms of how he governed, it was very sort of standard establishment Republican, just like George W. Bush, for example. Yeah, well, I don't have any real comments on that. Like I said, I'm not trying to- I don't think that Jordan Peterson has, like, Jordan Peterson hasn't really internalized the conservative talking points that a lot of his compatriots probably have. You know what I mean? Like he, like, I don't think Jordan Peterson has like the big pro Trump runoff list. He might now that he works for the Daily Wire, but he usually has like his own thing going on. Whitewashed Trump administration. I'm just pointing to a couple of things that he did that mm. he hasn't got credit for. Yeah, you should have got credit for. I actually enjoyed you were on the PBD podcast, I think it was recently, and you made a comment that you found Trump whiny, particularly over the, you know, common refrain that he can't stop saying he thinks the election was stolen and you know, well, correct me I if I'm wrong, but your commentary well, was like, move on. Well, I think, I think it's a strategic error on his part at minimum. I mean, Trump. Oh, that's your problem with it. Not that it's wrong, but that the optics are bad. How often does this happen where a conservative is like, as a, somebody's like, hello, conservative. Um, I've, I've heard that you have an issue with this monstrously immoral, evil thing that conservatives are doing. Um, and, and the person's like, yeah, I do, you know? I just, I, I think it's a bad look. I feel like it's a bad strategy. Portrays himself and thinks of himself as a winner. And part of his attractiveness on the populist front was his unabashed, victorious persona, let's say. And he's the guy that gets things done, and he's the guy that wins. But apparently, the election was stolen from him. And so that begs the question, are you the winner and the guy that gets things done, or are you the guy that lets things be stolen from you? <laughs> and the answer that Trump had always had was, well, I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy. I don't know who else I am, but I'm definitely the winner here. And I think that now campaigning as if he was the uh, victim, let's say, of a plot isn't going to do him any good. I think it was probably a fatal decision from a strategic perspective because mm. it's so off brand. And that has nothing, that's completely independent of whatever virtue the argument about the stolen election might have. Well, I don't- Yeah, what, yeah what's your position on that one? You know, you were, you were asked about your opinion on that, not just the optics of Trump failing to secure the coup. I believe that the 
that the judiciary in the United States is so corrupt that the, the possibility of a valid finding on the election fraud front has been reduced to zero. I don't find that credible. And then I do think, so I also think that that's, it's a mistake on that front. And it's a mistake for conservatives. It's a real mistake for conservatives to take that route because conservatives can't say all the institutions are corrupt and untrustworthy. That's what the radical leftists say. And populist conservatives tend to do that. And that really leaves them with nothing except maybe an appeal to public whim. And that's no way to govern. So I think that was a mistake too. Mm. So all of that, and he can't just say it's morally wrong to lie about the outcome of an election in an attempt to supplant it. But like, like, wouldn't that be the first thing any person would be driven to say? By default? Kyle looks so confused. I look confused. He's not saying anything. Uh, you know, you in your commentary, I do often hear a strong defense um, of our institutions. And I do feel like one of the common things that defines the current political era is definitely populism that bubbles up on the left uh, through the vessel of, say, a Bernie Sanders, and even what I would argue was a fake populism that came up on the right with Donald Trump, where the agreement does seem to be, well, hold on, these institutions are really not working for us, and they're broken, and they're fundamentally corrupt. And, you know, the genesis of it being, you have this donor class of corporations and billionaires that donates to politicians, and then they get elected and do the bidding of that donor class and the, and the corporations. Um, mm -hmm. Do you disagree with that analysis? Do you think that that's just overstating well, the problem and the institutions well, are actually I healthy or... Well, uh, I think it's partly a Tower of Babel problem. So I've been listening a fair bit to Russell Brand, who I quite like. Oh, um, no. Russell is very, very smart. He's definitely... Oh, God. Oh, my fucking God. It's the, go it's the motherfucking human centipede, Ouroboros. It's just shit being pumped into body after body. Oh, my God, dude. Russell Band has probably already made a video celebrating. <sighs> yeah, the the Far Cry Five cultist. One of the smartest people I've ever met. He's oh my god! Child. And he holy shit! Stuff like this really makes me wonder if there's just like it. It's just like the head hurty. If there's just like a problem in people's brains, shit like this is going to turn me into a fucking what do they call it? The skull measurers. The, um, um, a phrenologist. Yeah. Gotta turn me into a goddamn phrenologist. Every fucking one of these people got bite of 87. I have no idea what could lead a person to watch Russell Brand and think, wow, this is insightful. But I guess I just, I, I guess I just don't understand people. I don't know. I guess I just don't. I try to be, you know, appropriately relativist and about this and maintain a good sociological perspective. But sometimes it really does just seem like there are some types yeah it's just lead in the gasoline you know sometimes ch some channels just have lead in the gasoline i don't know he differs in his political utterances from me to a substantial degree although there's a fair bit of commonality as not well not really he's more he's beating the anti capitalism drum in a manner that i tend not to but there's a specific reason for that and the reason is that Russell has realized that size is a problem. And you know, the, the lefties tend to be skeptical of big government and the right-wingers tend to be, sorry, the lefties tend to be skeptical of big, big companies right. and the right-wingers tend to be skeptical of big government. Right. And I think the right way forward through all that mess is that we should be skeptical of big. All right, guys, what you just, which is why he spends all this time picking on trans people? Okay, yeah. I I I really got to talk to JP. I hope we're still are we still umfies? He's not going to stay off Twitter. He can't. Yeah, still umfies. Ah. He's he's depreciating the umfi power. When he first followed me, he, had, he was following 300 people, and now he's following 500. That sucks. Now I'm less special. 
Yeah, the, the oomphy economy is being distilled. Or dispersed. What's wrong with Russell Brand? I made videos on him, but the main issue is that he's a fucking retard. Um, Russell Brand's videos are conspiracy clickbait with nothing else. He's completely insane. Um, all of the so-called progressive prescriptions that he makes are, um, are like vague, asinine, if we all like believe we can overcome it type shit. But then he goes on to make like real fucking harmful takes, you know. When he makes direct empirical claims, they're almost always the wrong ones. And deeply conspiratorial at that. 